We are fact-checking the most common questions and misconceptions about biologic medications in the second episode of our biologic series. This podcast is made in partnership with the Allergy and Asthma Network, and we want to thank Sanofi Regeneron for sponsoring today's episode. While they support the show, all opinions are our own, and sponsorship does not influence our content or editorial decisions. Any mentions of brands is for informational purposes and not an endorsement. Now let's get fact-checking. You're listening to The Itch, a podcast exploring all things allergy, asthma, and immunology. Today, we have a very special guest, Dr. Jamie Rutland. He is a good friend and an amazing pulmonologist. We are going to be talking about biologics and myths around biologics. So let's just get started. Jamie, can you introduce yourself real quick? Yeah. So I'm Dr. Jamie Rutland. I'm a pulmonary critical care physician in Southern California who specializes in autoimmune and allergic diseases as they pertain to the lung. So we're going to get into a whole bunch of myths very shortly, but you might be curious, what is a biologic? Well, we have covered that with Dr. Berger. So if you want to know your 101 biologics, go check out our episode with Dr. Berger and then come back here and bust some myths with us. So Dr. Rutland, welcome. The first one is, biologics, we hear so much positive stuff about it. And the question is, are biologics secure? So are biologics secure? That's a great question. The way that I would look at this is, I would say, no, they're not a cure, right? Whatever disease that you have, if you have asthma, if you have eosinophilic granulomatosis or polyenditis, whatever you're using your biologic for, you still actually have that condition. What the biologic is actually doing is it's inhibiting one of the inflammatory mediators that leads to inflammation, right? Or that leads to the pathophysiology that you're demonstrating. So essentially, a biologic is very therapeutic and it helps you and it can calm down the inflammatory process and enough for you to feel significantly better, but it's not a cure. Biologics are just like traditional medications and they work in the same way. Biologics aren't just like traditional medications. And by that, I mean, they're not a traditional medicine that you take by mouth and you swallow the pill. They are medications that are designed to specifically inhibit a certain inflammatory mediator that's released from certain cells or designed to inhibit a certain cell receptor. So traditional medications, and I think this is what my good friend means, traditional medications generally act. They are medications that act at multiple different receptors and affect multiple different things. Whereas precision medications like biologics specifically target one receptor or one cytokine and inhibit that downstream of events. Now, it's important for us to understand where is that receptor located on which cells? How is that cytokine released? What is it going to bind to? In other words, where is the receptor located? So we can understand the downstream of events that will not be taking place. But in that sense, biologics are precise traditional medications are imprecise. That's probably as simple as it gets. Great. And then we want to go into side effects. So there is a myth that there are severe side effects and that's inevitable when you start a biologic. You know, that's another great question. I think that when you look at biologic therapies, it kind of depends on what the biologic is inhibiting to truly understand the range of adverse effects that can take place. Severe side effects of biologic therapies exist, but it's extremely and exceedingly rare. Like I have, I personally have never seen anybody have anaphylaxis from any of the biologics that I have prescribed for a multitude of allergic conditions. Biologics will eventually become ineffective if used long term. So that that doesn't really take place. There is a certain percentage of individuals who do develop antibodies to the biologic. It's somewhere in the range of 2 to 4%. So it's very, very rare for this to take place. But generally speaking, no. Over the course of the long haul, biologics aren't more ineffective as you continue to use them. Great. And another myth we have is that once you start a biologic, you have to stay on it for the rest of your life. <laughs> so this is actually a myth that I probably agree with. And the reason that I agree with this myth is because if you continue to live in the same environment, in the same area of the country per se, or the same area of the world, whatever the antigen is that's activating your inflammatory response as it pertains to the upper airway or your lower airway or your GI tract, 
that antigen still remains. And so I think that in that sense, yeah, you need to remain on that biologic therapy sort of indefinitely because you're still being exposed. The only time I ever remove a biologic therapy is when a patient moves to another part of the world. If a patient moves to another part of the world, I'll give them a shot at not being on the biologic therapy. So if a patient were to move from, say, New York, where Piel lives, to Southern California, Orange County, where I live, if the patient wanted to be off of their biologic, I would let them have a shot and see if the environment is going to stimulate the same inflammatory response. If it doesn't, they stay off it. If it does, then we're going to put them right back on that therapy. So another myth, biologics are only an option when all other treatments have failed. Yeah, no, that, that's not the case. So biologics are an option when treatments are continuing to work, but you need a little bit more of an anti-inflammatory effect for the patient to have better symptoms, for, to get rid of some of those symptoms. So when you look at biologic therapies in general, biologics are in conjunction with a patient's standard of care. So a patient will be on their standard of care therapy. They're still demonstrating symptoms. They're still presenting to the hospital, to the ER, to the urgent care, to the clinic with symptoms. And then you add on a biologic therapy to further reduce that inflammatory response so that patients can feel even better. And this kind of goes with this other myth that you can stop taking your usual medications. Yeah. So by that same rationale, the indication for a biologic is patient who's on standard of care therapy and then you are adding on a biologic in addition to their current therapy. So in other words, you need to stay on your therapy. With that being said, I mean, we all have patients. Some patients will stop their traditional or their standard of care and they shouldn't. And I never, ever endorse that and say you should do that. I always say you need to stay on your standard of care. Patients that do stop their standard of care, some of the payers, the insurance companies that pay for their medications, they will find out that they've stopped because they're not picking up their inhaler and the pharmacy will tell the payer and the payer will say, we're not paying for this biologic anymore because it's not indicated. And technically speaking, they're right because it's add-on therapy, meaning you need to stay on your standard of care. If you have more than one health issue, you can't use biologics. That's actually very false. So if you have more than one health issue, say, for example, there are patients that have atopic dermatitis, eczema, and they have asthma. Knowing that, your biologic may actually be able to treat both atopic dermatitis and asthma. And so in that sense, the patient's going to do really, really, really well. And these are the things that we see. So just because you have more than one health issue doesn't mean that you're not a candidate for biologic. In fact, it could be an indication for biologic. Biologics are only for adults. Yeah, biologics are not only for adults. There's biologics that are approved to kids down to six months of age for certain conditions. And so I think it's very important for us to understand the indications of biologics if you're going to use them and prescribe them. And even more than that, it's important for us to understand the range and the different pathophysiologies that biologics can be used for. Biologics can cause cancer, particularly lymphoma. Yeah, biologics do not cause cancer. Biologics do not cause lymphoma. I do think it's important for us to understand the mechanism with which these biologics are acting, to understand the certain adverse events and side effects that take place, and understand the inflammatory responses we are inhibiting, but they don't cause cancer. Biologics suppress the immune system entirely, making patients more susceptible to infection. You know, this is a great myth to discuss. Biologics do not completely suppress the immune system biologics inhibit certain cytokines and chemokines that may contribute to inflammation of your lung, of your GI tract, of your upper airway, of your skin. And so it's important for us to understand that pathophysiologic process, but we also know that it doesn't completely inhibit the immune system. All right. How about this one? Physicians are overly eager to prescribe biologics. And then there's a caveat because of financial reasons. Physicians are not overly eager to prescribe biologics because of financial reasons. We don't prescribe them because we get paid extra uh, when we prescribe them. We prescribe them because the patient is suffering. And when the patient is suffering and going through something that we can relate to, we really, really, really want to help them. In fact, I would say that biologics are underprescribed. There are a lot of patients out there that are suffering that aren't getting the appropriate therapies, including biologic. I can't tell you how many times I get a second, third, fourth opinion on a patient who's just been suffering. And not only are they not on standard of care, but if they are on standard of care, they haven't even been considered to be prescribed biologic 
because of either lack of knowledge or lack of know-how within that particular community to get the biologic approved. And I'd like to take it one step further that a lot of physicians are not prescribing because it also is very challenging to get insurance companies to approve these biologics. So in fact, it takes multiple office staff and a lot of hard work to get patients actually on these medications. And so oftentimes they're not prescribed because a physician may not feel comfortable even being able to get it approved. Great. Okay. So note to patients, they're not getting any money. They just want you to get better. (laughs) Exactly. How about this one? So I'm five days into Dupixin. And uh, I'm just like observing myself like crazy. And this is a myth that we came across is that biologics work immediately. You know, biologics don't work immediately, right? It, it, when you think about the inflammatory process that takes place secondary to an allergic disease, where you have multiple cytokines that are already being released constantly, it takes a few days for that biologic to have its impact. And so overall, When you're looking at the impact of a biologic, there are biologics that work within, say, two weeks. Like if you look at a certain biologic, and I don't know if I can say the product or not, but if you look at Dupilumab, which is a biologic that inhibits the interleukin 4 receptor, when you look at the actual data, if you look at the FEV1, which is the amount of air you breathe out in the first second, that FEV1 will improve within two weeks by 70% in most patients. So that's something that I think is very positive, and it also helps me out because I can look at my patient and say, listen, if this medication is going to work, you're probably going to know within about two weeks from a breathing standpoint. Biologics are still in the experimental stage and pose high risks. Biologics are not in the experimental stage. We already went through the clinical trials. That was the experimental stage. So they don't really pose high risks. Um, There are risks associated with anything. There are risks that are involved. When we talk about the adverse events, we talk about the side effects that can take place, but the risks aren't high. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been approved in the first place. Next myth. Biologics must be administered in a hospital setting. Biologics do not need to be administered in the hospital setting. Biologics can be administered with proper training at home, in your office, wherever you are, because they are completely safe and effective therapies for individuals with certain allergic conditions. And I can just say from experience that I did my first dose at the doctor because they wanted to show me how it works. And now I can do it at home. And it seems really, really easy, actually. The next myth we have is that biologics are interchangeable. Okay. So this is a myth that I really, really like to speak on. Biologics are not interchangeable. We have to understand the pathophysiology of our patient's condition to be able to select an appropriate therapy for our patient. Example, if a patient produces a lot of mucus, that means that their goblet cell is likely being stimulated, right? So if you look at the immunology of this, the goblet cell is stimulated by interleukin-13. So what you want to do is you want to inhibit interleukin-13 and interleukin-4 because it needs interleukin-4 to be completely stimulated. And that's why you would select dupilumab in that sense, because your patient's producing a lot of mucus, you know that interleukin-4 and 13 are up. If you measure a pheno in a patient, and I'm sure you guys have discussed what pheno is on this podcast, but if you measure a pheno in a patient and your pheno is elevated, say greater than 20 to 25 parts per billion, pheno is heavily associated with interleukin-13. So the higher the pheno, the higher the interleukin-13 activity. So again, you want to select a biologic that's going to inhibit interleukin-13. So It's important for us to understand that although the disease states between biologics may be similar, somebody may say, oh, it's approved for eosinophilic asthma, it doesn't necessarily mean that you could just pick whatever one you want. We have to still understand the patient, what they're going through to truly understand how we can help them best. Yes. And the idea around precision medicine is just getting stronger and stronger. And it's exciting to think about how specific we're going to be in the future for these patients. So biologics are only recommended by specialists. Great. So what payers will tell you is that the only people that can prescribe biologics are specialists like an allergist or a pulmonologist. What I will tell you is anyone that is ready and willing to learn the material, to understand the allergic disease at stake, to understand how to apply the immunology and select appropriate biologics, they can write for it. I have no issue with a primary care provider or whoever prescribing a biologic so long as that 
healthcare provider understands the immunology of the disease process and understands how to select them and also understands the adverse events and side effects that can take place. I got no issue with it, right? But I understand why payers want specialists to prescribe because they feel that we have had the appropriate education and they're probably right. But I also want to be able to create awareness around severe allergic disease because there are so many patients that are without. And there are so many instances, at least in the United States and probably in other countries, where there aren't specialists around for hundreds and thousands of miles. And so the primary care provider or the GP provider in that area needs to have this knowledge. So myth, biologics eliminate the need for lifestyle changes. No, biologics don't eliminate the need for lifestyle changes. I think that if you can understand the antigen that's causing the inflammatory process, let's try to remove that antigen, right? Let's think about that lifestyle process, right? If you're allergic to dogs and cats, and it's been demonstrated on your skin by an allergist, let's try to remove that antigen if we can, right? If you're unwilling because you're in love with it, I understand. But biologics aren't a replacement for common sense. And so lifestyle changes are common sense. And so we have to continue with those lifestyle changes if they're going to help our disease process. Absolutely. And things like Zolaer that are now approved for food allergy, we have to remember that we still have to avoid that food allergen. We still have to carry around the epinephrine device. And just being on amalizumab, which is the biologic that's recommended for food allergy now, is not a cure and is not a replacement for all of those lifestyle changes. And we've come to our last myth. And this has been a quick episode because Dr. Rutland has some kiddos that need to get to school. So our last myth is biologics are unnecessary if the symptoms are not severe. Another myth. Biologics are necessary. Again, I, I don't quite understand the difference between a severe symptom and not. It seems pretty subjective to me. So a severe symptom to me might be persistent cough. That might not be a severe symptom to a primary care provider. They might be like, oh, the patient coughs, who cares? They're just coughing. But for me, that's a severe symptom. So the way that I look at it is like this. If a patient continues to present to me with, let's say, rash and cough, right? And wheezing. Or if I'm listening to the patient and the patient may not be complaining, but every time I listen to their lung, they're wheezing. That patient just has lived with this for so long that they have this new normal. So they're just used to it. But for me, who understands the pathophysiology of disease, this isn't supposed to happen. A patient can't be walking around wheezing with an FEV1 of 62% predicted, even though the patient says they feel fine. I know that's not fine because I know that that inflammatory process is continuing to take place over time. And when that happens, you start to get air remodeling. You can get skin remodeling, right? Where you start to have extensive scar because of persistent itching and scratching or persistent inflammation in a certain area of the skin. So these are going to be permanent parts on your body for the rest of your life. It's my job to be able to recognize inflammation and control that inflammation as best I can to prevent scar, to prevent presentation to an urgent care, an ER, my office. And that's what I feel like my role in the patient's life is. My role is to prevent them from presenting with life-altering illness, not just life-threatening, but life-altering illness. Great. Thank you so much, Jamie. That was awesome. Thanks for making time and for finally being on the Itch Podcast. I've been waiting for this for my entire life. I have been very jealous, and I thought that my good friend Payel was being Wrong, rude, and inconsiderate, uh, which made me feel hurt. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Thank you for listening to today's episode. Remember that all information you hear today is for informational purposes only and are not intended to serve as a substitute for the consultation, diagnosis, and or medical treatment of a qualified physician or healthcare provider. And also, don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. And if you have a second, help spread the word by rating our podcast and sharing with your friends and family who might also be interested in learning more about allergies, asthma, and immunology. You can always stay up to date by checking out our Instagram, The Itch Podcast, where you can leave questions you are itching to know, or check out our website, which is www itchpodcast.com, which contains more information about the subjects we covered in today's episode and every episode. Until next time, have a fabulous week.